Thank you, Pastor Devin. Good morning, everybody. Dads, happy Father's Day. Hey, come on. Let's give the dads all of a round of applause. Well, hey, if we haven't met, my name is Juan Palomino, and I get to be one of the pastors here at First Christian Church in Newbury Park. And I just want to welcome all of you uh, to this glorious Sunday. Uh, if you're a newcomer, uh, you're the first time visiting us, we want you to know that you are our VIP guest. Uh, thank you so much for visiting with us. Can we give our newcomers, visitors a round of applause too? Thanks for being here. Also, those of you watching online, uh, dads, if you're already barbecuing, hey, shout out to you. You couldn't make it this morning. It's all good. Happy Father's Day. Um, well, we are in a message series called Jesus Is. Say it with me. Jesus is. And we've been going through the book of Hebrews. And this weekend, we are in chapter 10 once again. But we're going to focus on the second half of the chapter. So if you have your Bibles, you could turn to that. If not, don't you worry. We got your back. We got you covered. We'll have them on the slides uh, behind me. Now, last week, if you were here, <clears throat> Pastor Devin did a phenomenal job of walking us through the Day of Atonement. The significance of it, the symbolism of it for the Hebrew nation, and how that tied to the bigger picture of what God was going to do. Jesus' atonement. His sacrifice that takes away the sins of the world for those who believe. Can I get an amen out there? Amen. All right. Hey, church, you can participate with me. I'm good. Pastor Juan's a little different, right? But different is good. Can I get one more amen to that? All right. There, there it is. Come on. So today, uh, before we stand together, uh, just prepare for that. We're going to stretch out your legs in a little bit and we read the verses together out loud. I want to give you a couple reminders and I'm also going to give you a little more context and then I'll get into the message. Is that okay with everyone? We're good? Okay. Well, even if you weren't, we're going that way. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so a reminder again, this letter was written to Hebrew Christians. This letter, or like Pastor Ken said a few uh, weeks ago, this whole sermon, but particularly this chapter, chapter 10, is, is filled with encouragement, with hope, with action steps, and an extremely strong warning. So the context is this. These Hebrew Christians were very familiar with difficulties associated with being a follower of Jesus. In AD 49, the emperor Claudius believed that the Jews of the city were rioting over whether or not Jesus should be called the Jewish Messiah. And so as you can imagine, not all the Jews agreed, which led to this intense infighting in the Jewish community. And so to restore order in the city of Rome... Claudius decreed that all the Jews be exiled from the city. So not distinguishing between those who identified with Christ and those who rejected him. And so their expulsion was accompanied with public shaming, with imprisonments, and the plundering of property. And the expelled Christians, they endured this injustice with joy, everybody. Once again, with joy, confident that their heavenly inheritance was going to be far better and more enduring than any earthly possessions. Can you imagine that? So they knew that they were simply following everyone in the footsteps of Jesus himself, who was also unjustly accused. He was abused and shamed. But let me fast forward you. Fast forward to A.D. 54. Claudius dies. And there's a new emperor. His name is Nero. He's the next one. And so Nero didn't enforce the, the edict of kicking the Jews out of the city. And many Jews, Christian and non-Christian, returned to the city. But can I just tell you something? Nero was a shady cat. Yeah, I know what a shady. Okay, he was the villain. Okay. And in A.D. 64, this large fire destroyed a large part of Rome, and rumors spread that the emperor himself had instigated the fire. Imagine lighting your own house on fire. 
And so he orders Christians to be arrested, and some are sent to the arena to be torn by dogs. Others are crucified or burned alive to serve as night lamps. How about that? In his gardens. And so now these Christians, picture that. These Christians are now faced with a tempting option. What is that, pastor? Well, it's to deny Jesus and go back to the old system, the law. Again, that Pastor Ken and, and Pastor Devin have been teaching, and they taught you know, up to last week what that law is or was. And they wanted to stick to their old faith that they were raised in, to go back to the old ways, since it was specifically that Christians, these Christians became Nero's scapegoat. And some ethically Jewish Christians were so enticed by this option that they began to withdraw from other Christian communities. And though they endured the persecution under Claudius with joy, everybody, this time, unfortunately, they shrunk back, fearing suffering and death. And they forgot the basic principles of God's word and that followers of Jesus should expect suffering like he did. Unfortunately, again, many of them went back to their old ways. So would you do me a favor and please stand for the reading of the word of God. We're going to read Hebrews 10, verses 22 through 31. And I chose the uh, ESV here, translation. Here's what it says. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Say hope with me. Hope. hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider, there's a lot of lettuce, not lettuce in your burger, but lettuce. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation, expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Again, this is all old law, Old Testament. But here's it, here it is for us. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? Happy Father's Day. And has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. What does it say there? The Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Pray with me. Heavenly Father. These words, these words are bold. And we know we're in your presence here at church. We are the church. And so help us to examine our ways, Lord, every single one of us, and test them. And we ask you through your Holy Spirit to help us return to you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay. So now that you're awake, there's three exhortations, action steps, if you will, in these verses that we just read. Now, I'm not going to belabor the first one that says, let us draw near to God, verse 22. If you need to hear more about that, man, go back to last week. Pastor Devin did a phenomenal job of exegeting that. But the point is, is that we're no longer underneath this old system. Through Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, that is the new system, the new covenant. Salvation, everyone, is by faith through grace in Jesus Christ. The pathway to God is a new and living way. Again, it's a new covenant. And so we can walk straight into the most holy place spiritually. Verse 23 the next exhortation says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. We are reminded that God is faithful. 
Hebrews chapter 6, a few chapters back, tells us, confirms that God cannot lie. It is impossible for God to lie. What he has promised will come to pass. We know the truth and we should stand firm in what we believe. So I want to read to you something a little more old school, uh, something that, you know, we have probably not read in a very long time. If you guys, anybody know the Apostles' Creed? Okay, some of you already kind of clenched and went, uh oh, he's going to read that. I am. We should. I'm going to read it to you. This is what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Check. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Check. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. We could do better than that. Let's try. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried, and he descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. Yes. yes. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Yes. He will come again and judge the living and the dead. Yes. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Yes. I believe in the Holy Universal Church. Yes. The communion of saints. The forgiveness of sins, yes. the resurrection of the body, yes. and life everlasting. Amen. Yes. You guys sound great. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good deeds. Verse 24. Faith, everyone, is something that you cannot do alone. Papas, dads, I'm going to emphasize you. You cannot live a Christian life by yourself. See, we need each other, everybody, to encourage one another, to challenge one another, to pray for one another, to confess to one another, and more importantly is to love one another, especially when we are unlovable. And all the moms said, amen. <laughs> See, we can only do such things if we don't neglect meeting together. So I had some questions as I was writing this sermon. I, you know, these, these things just come to my mind. And I, if you've heard me teach, preach here before, I mean, I just, I, I just talk about them. Right? And here's what came to my mind. Let me ask you this. Why do you think that some of us neglect our responsibility to meet together consistently? Let me ask it a different way. Why do you think less people are attending church regularly or leaving church altogether? See, when I read the scriptures, we know why, they, we know why the Hebrew Christians were meeting less and less. Because they were being persecuted. They were being persecuted. They were being imprisoned. They were being exiled from the city. Their property was being plundered. Can I ask anybody, anybody going through that here today? That's what I thought. And so I did some more research, and I went back to two, the, the, the year, you guys remember the year 2000? <laughs> Gallup polls, Barna, The Guardian, Washington Post, Secular and Christian. You know, I, I did all this study, and these are some of the reasons that stood out why people don't attend church regularly or at all. Now, you know what's sad is that only 3 in 10 U.S. adults attend re religious services regularly. That's not even just Christians. I'm talking about religious services regularly, three in ten. And so I'm going to start these backwards. I'm probably going to mess up people in the back, but uh, just bear with me. They will all come up because they're kind of in this order. Church doesn't align with my views anymore. <laughs> you hear that out loud? Oh, the church doesn't align with my views. 2020 forward, political views. Number four, technology. I'm, saying, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Technology is a good thing. I'm grateful for technology. Okay? If you're sick, like some people are sick, they, you can watch at home. Hey, everybody online, they're watching me now. That's cool. Also, if you're on vacation, you could tune in, if you, know, if you tune in on a Sunday. But here's the point. There's so many options readily available, and you can have access to this message anytime. You can watch it on Monday while you're working out. You can watch it after school when you're done doing your homework. That would be a great A student. God bless you students if you do that. 
Now, back in the days, you remember back in the days before technology, if you missed the 10 a.m. service, you're screwed. <laughs> if you missed it, you missed it. You should have been there. The next one is, oh, I don't feel connected. Not finding community. The next one is indifference. Ah, eh, just not interested anymore. Which grows to apathy. Lack of passion and excitement about the things of God. And then finally, the number one thing was people stopped believing in the religion's teachings. Did you guys see a pattern there? You see a regression pattern there? And so let me ask you this, church, this morning, and those watching online, let us examine our ways. Examine yourself. And I want you to just play with me today, this morning, okay? Here's what I mean. Tell the neighbor next to you, why do you attend church? Go ahead. Why do you attend church? Why do you attend church? Those of you online, tell the person next to you. Why do you attend church? All right. Okay, come on back. Come on back. Come on back. All right. You guys ready? You don't attend church. You are the church. Thanks for coming. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Listen, attending church, I don't care what row you sit in. For those of us that don't want to be kind of you know, inconspicuous and, hey, I don't want anybody to know me. If you're sitting in the back or those of you sitting in the front, it doesn't matter where you sit. Sitting in a row consuming church doesn't make us good at being the church. Being the church has to do with living our lives for Christ. Demonstrating God's love by serving others. And sharing our faith, our hope in Jesus with people Monday through Saturday. Thank you for that. See, that's very different, church, than consuming church, again, in any of the rows. That's good. I'm glad. This is a good thing. Again, I'm not saying, I mean, I'm going to go into that. Keep meeting together. But what I'm saying here is that you could just easily, you can easily consume at home. And many have chosen that. Let me, let me drive this point. I'm a Lakers fan still. Thank you. One, see what I mean? Still. There was three. Woo! Right? You got to get rid of a couple guys, and I'm not going to name them, but one of them was 23. Um, <clears throat> not one amen? Okay. Do you guys remember the Lakers era, like 99 through 2002, right? The three P? Come on, somebody. Right? Do you guys remember, you know, Kobe Bryant, Shaquille O'Neal, Pal Gasol, the Spaniard? You remember Robert Ory, even Derek Fisher? How about this? Do you guys remember Sam Jacobson? Liars. <laughs> you know why no one remembers Sam Jacobson? He was a round one, pick 26 of the NBA. It's because that fool only averaged three points a game in the regular season. How about 2001, Mike Penberthy, who came out of Masters College. Anybody remember Mike? Anybody ever buy a jersey of Mike Penberthy? <laughs> Anybody wear his shoes? Nope. This dude averaged two points per game in his career. He, he's got a ring, but no one's going to talk about who? Mike Penberthy. Let's go back to the era. Ready? The Magic Show. Magic Johnson, right? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Michael Cooper. Everyone even remembers a Kurt Rambis. But let me ask you this. Who is Clayton Johnson? Anybody got his jersey? Not Magic Johnson. Don't confuse him. No one remembers him, and he's a 1982 champion. What, what, am, what am I saying? What are you saying, Pastor Juan? You can show up to the game and even be dressed in your Sunday's best but nobody's going to remember your name if you're not in the game. Oh, that rhymed. <laughs> this is being recorded, right? Yeah. <laughs> See, the real reason we go to church today is that you've moved from being a consumer to being a contributor. You can ride the bench, I mean the chair, the pew at church and enjoy the service. Nothing wrong with that. We, we, we want you here. We need you here because we need one another, but you got to get in the game. If not, you're going to get cut, released on waivers, 
be a free agent and end up with the Clippers. <laughs> What's the other team that plays at crypto? I don't, oh yeah, yeah, I, the Clippers, yeah. So what's the game plan? All right, let's get serious here. What's the game plan to be on Team Jesus? Well, he's given it to us, given it to us here. The, he, the author is saying, draw near to God. Put all your hope only in Jesus. Hold fast to the confession that we just professed earlier. And don't waver. You're in the, that's, that's right, getting in the game. Practice. And guess what? Stir up one another to love and good deeds. Don't stop meeting together. Show up to church on Sunday consistently, practice. Meet with your life group during the week. Get in a life group. Get in community during the week. Get into a Bible study. Serve others. Stop being a consumer only. We don't attend the church. We are. Say it with me. We don't attend the church. We are the church. If you don't get in the game... Eventually, you're going to be complaining. Oh, my gosh. My Christian complaining brothers and sisters. You begin to watch online only, even though you're healthy and nothing's wrong with you because it's more convenient. You'll get disconnected. You lose interest in your faith. You'll become apathetic. And then you'll finally stop believing in God's word and his word. And so let me read the warning if you're heading in that direction. Let's read it again. Verse 26 through 31. For if we go on sinning deliberately after we receive the knowledge of truth, what truth? That Jesus is king. He is Lord and Savior. That he is risen. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. That the only forgiveness of your sins is through Jesus. There no longer remains a sacrifice for your sins then. But a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume his adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy of the evidence of two or three witnesses. That doesn't, the old law doesn't apply to us. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? Can I tell you, I paused there when I was studying this and I cried my eyes out. I wasn't thinking of you, I was thinking of me selfishly. Going, how am I doing that? And has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified And has outraged the spirit of grace. My wife and I met a couple eight years ago. He was part of a motorcycle club. And everything that that lifestyle comes with. She was a dancer at a gentleman's club. And everything that that lifestyle comes with. They came to church. And church, let me tell you something. We saw how God transformed their lives. They made church a commitment on Sundays. We've had the honor and privilege for the last, you know, 10 plus years, over a decade, to run a ministry called Celebrate Recovery on Friday nights. We do that here at this church. And they formed a community that loved them, that prayed for them, that encouraged them, that challenged them. And like all of us, their life wasn't perfect. Can I get one amen out there? <laughs> and they still had character defects that they, you know, they had rocky patches in their marriage, of course. The kids still fought and acted like kids. Not one amen out there. That's fine. <laughs> but you know what they did? They, they kept drawing near to God. Holding on to Jesus and not wavering. Meeting with other imperfect Christians at church on Sunday and Friday nights that stirred them to love and to good deeds, good works. And then the time came when they had to move to Bakersfield because, you know, the husband got a better job opportunity and they found a church there. We kept in touch. This church had to celebrate recovery there. So they joined, uh, you know, she got in, went all in, became a leader, part of the leadership team. We had conversations during the years, you know, of their progression and, um, we ask, hey, how's your husband doing? He's busy. He's working, but, you know, we're, we're getting, you know, above water and, you know, we're, we're moving forward. Then eventually they moved one more time. They moved to the Lone Star State, to Texas. And then you know what happened? We began to hear less and less from them. We began to see social media posts that were no longer congruent with their beliefs.
or three weeks ago. We got a phone call and said that he was on life support. And the wife had to let him go last week. And why? Because church no longer aligned with their worldly view. COVID happened. We got used to just watching online. We just watch when it's convenient and it fits our schedule. They joined a new bike club down there, motorcycle club. So they ride on Sundays and that becomes a priority. And they began to not feel connected anymore at their church. They lost interest. Apathy set in. They're no longer excited and passionate about the things of God. And then finally, they stopped believing. And they went back to their old ways. See, for a few of us, church, please hear me out. It's a slippery slope. But for the majority of people that I've been pastoring, it's a gradual regression. And if you're thinking, well, sorry to hear that, pastor. You know, we'll pray for you and we get that and for them. And, but that won't happen to me. I've been a Christian 25 years. You know what that's called? Everyone's called Pride. Let, let the scripture talk to you this morning. Put it up for me, please. This is from the message translation. These are all warning markers. Danger, the Bible tells us. In our history books, written down so that we don't repeat whose mistakes, their mistakes. Our positions in the story are parallel. They at the beginning, we at the end. And we are just as capable of messing it up as they were. Don't be so naive and self-confident. You're not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Cultivate what? See, we have to reserve a daily time, everyone, with God for self-examination first. Look in the mirror first and not out the window. Do you see what they're doing? Do you see what they did? you see what they're up to? We have to self-examine first and sure, read our Bibles and absolutely pray for one another in order to know God and his will for our lives and to gain the power to carry all that out. But can I ask you these questions? How are you shrinking back for your faith? Self-examine. What's the proof that you are a contributor and not just a consumer at church? How do I... Oh, who? Who do I have in my life that stirs me to love and good works? And I'm not counting your spouses. They don't count because you don't listen to them. <laughs> and a few said amen. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you for the confession this morning. Oh, the wife said that about their husband. Amen. <laughs> Here's a big one. How are you imitating the faith of those that you read about in the Bible? You know what gives me hope, though? I have hope. Anybody have hope? I do. Yeah. We'll go through struggles. We'll go through persecution. We'll go through challenges. You know, this past Friday, we had a graduation at Celebrate Recovery, and we had nine new graduates. Yes. Thank you. They went through this spiritual growth discipleship process. We under. We mask it with the recovery word and scares people. But they went through this process of six months of, of just drawing closer to God. And they shared how their faith had grown. And they're no longer wavering because God has been faithful. And he's removed shame and guilt and anxiety and all these different things from people. And sure, there's some that struggle with drugs and alcohol in the program. But that's less than a third of people. And over 36 of you at this church including the nine, have graduated through the program in 18 months. 36. And something has reignited in their souls and their spirits. To have passion, to be more devoted to Jesus. And so as I wrap up, we need to keep our eye on the ultimate goal, everyone. 
what has been promised to us. The great reward that awaits us when Jesus returns or he calls us home. And so I'm going to close here by reading to you the end of that chapter, 32 through 39. And then I'm going to invite those of you that have professed your faith in Jesus and call yourself a believer in Christ to repent and to admit because we're in the right place. And to say, God, I've been a consumer and not a contributor. Use me to draw others to you. In your own broken testimony, in the way you are, God can use you. If he's used my wife and I to help 36 people in this church, come on, man. It's like, I don't even have to fix my hair anymore. It's like, Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. I'm also going to talk to those of you that came today, you were invited by someone that maybe have fallen away or maybe have never had a relationship with Jesus Christ. Today is the day of salvation. Today I invite you to draw near to God through Jesus Christ. Remember how you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes, again, he's speaking to these Hebrew Christians, but I want you to hear it in the light of what you're going through. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten, and sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail, and when all you owned was taken from you, and you accepted it with joy. You knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. Can I get an amen in there? So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patience, endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you, yes, you will receive all that he has promised. For just in a little while, the coming one, Jesus, will come and not delay. And my righteous ones will live by faith, but I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. No, 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 we're not. We are faithful ones whose souls will be saved. I've been, I've been at this church for two years, and I know it's very uncommon. I'm going to just say it. When a pastor comes up here and does an altar call for you to just sit at your chair and go, I don't want people to see me. But I want to remind you that one day we will be face to face with him. And I don't care what you all think about me. Because the only thing that's going to matter is what, what? what he thinks about me. And so I'll break that now in the name of Jesus that you're done worrying about what people think about you. And if you want to repent and say, you know what, I'm in, Pastor Juan, what you're saying because God spoke to me. I want to invite you to come up now and I will pray over you. And if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to draw, draw near to him, not me, to him. He's here already, but as an act of saying, I'm drawing near, I want to step up. And I want to pray for you. So I want to invite you right now to come up. And I will pray for you. Come on up. Come on up. Nudge the person next to you. Nudge them. Tell them to come up. Don't be scared. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up, yes. Come on in the back, yes. Come on up. Come on up. 
Yes. Come on up. Yes. Come on up. Come on up. Amen. Come on up. Draw near to God. Come on up. Draw near to God. Amen. Amen. Come on up. Yes. Draw near to God. I see you all. Come on up. Yes, they're still coming. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Yes, come on up, church. Come on up. We got plenty of, there's room in the, in the house of God. Don't be scared. Come on up, church. Amen. Come on up. Amen. There's a new beginning. God is calling you. Come on up. Draw near to God. Amen. Amen. I see you all. Amen. 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 Pray with me. Those of you who are sitting, if you can extend a hand to these folks, amazing. We're going to pray like we do, First Christian Church, New Gray Park style. Dear Heavenly Father, I draw near to you, God, as an act of repentance. I want to ask you for forgiveness, for coming and just consuming, Lord, and hearing, and that's a good thing. But your word tells me that I have to not just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of it. So I ask you that you reignite a passion, an excitement, a love for the things that you have, God. That you use me beyond what I could think, dream, or imagine, Heavenly Father. You promised that I have the Holy Spirit inside of me right now. And that I could do great works like the ones that you did and even greater. Those are your words. And so I repent. And as Isaiah 6, 8 says, here am I, send me. That is my prayer. And Father, this is my first time ever accepting you. I want to receive your one and only son, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. I leave all my sins at the foot of the cross, knowing that he paid for my sins. And I know that there is no more condemnation for me because I am in Christ Jesus. And I ask your Holy Spirit to fill me right now from this day forward, June 16th on Father's Day. I draw near to you, Father, on this day as a remembrance every single year as it becomes Father's Day. I know that today I made the decision to accept your Son as Lord and Savior and to be the leader and Lord of my life. Use me. Help me to be the church, not just come and consume and be more like your son Jesus. It's in his powerful name that we all pray. And everyone said, amen. Every church, give everybody a round of applause that came up. God bless you. To return to your seats. God bless you.